Hi, right, folks, it's Brian here. <laughs> Audrey's behind the camera, and um, we're lucky enough now to actually have a little conversation with Kelly Manzoni. Thank you for having me. She is helping teach the, uh, the class that we're in right now. This is day one of two days of Indian clubs and mace. Yes. Got a mace workout, uh, which has been fantastic so far, actually. So a couple questions for sure. you. Um, how did you first start using Indian clubs in college? Where, where, did, where did that come from? Because it's not very well known. Well, so back when I got started in fitness about 17 years ago, as far as my career was concerned, and I had always kind of been interested in history and physical culture in, in English. So I was never a math and science student, so I just gravitated towards history and English. When I got into fitness, I realized that even though I was working in mainstream fitness when I got to start in corporate, uh, in a corporate facility, that I, I never quite understood why we were taking people and sitting them down and having them do machines like this. Oh, so, no, I put that together until just now. Yeah, you sit I, it, in front of a screen all day and then you go to work out and you sit down and you push. It yeah, down. and at that time they were really pushing like you know like a circuit of like eleven machines, right? That people would sit down, press, and sit this. And I had always been like, but this is not how humans move. So I was, you know, been a lifelong athlete. I was a dancer, a gymnast, a swim team, track team, softball. I always kind of dabbled in, and I was a mover. So I have really bad ADD. So the way that I process in my do my best thinking, no, it's like it gets a little complicated sometimes, was through movement. So once it became my career, I realized that um, the current state of what the, the current physical culture was, I was like, there has to be more out there. So I, in the uh, mid-2000s, I was introduced, I think, in 2006 to uh, kettlebells, which is my one of my favorite tools. It has in my heart kettlebell. Kettlebells seem to be like the entry drug. Well, because I think what happens with the kettlebell is it keeps you present, and there's, there's a sense of how the kettlebell becomes an extension of your body, and there's a communication of that tactility with the hand, and there's technique involved, and then there's time to create tension, time to not create tension, and it's really cool when you take a bell, and you know it's of a moderate weight, but if your technique is right, it's almost weightless. You know, it's still fatiguing and challenging, and that applies with mace training and, and whatnot. But um, I had then kind of gone down the rabbit hole, um, and I was very fortunate to Lugio as my first kettlebell mentor. And at that time, he had balavas, which were short maces, and uh, that he had produced, and um, Indian clubs. And then I got pregnant, took my kettlebell test while I was pregnant. I was still using the balavas for a few exercises. So basically, you know that one that she has out there that was that short condensed mace that had like the metal shot in it? It's even a shorter version. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what they're called. And I had two of them from him and I had my first pair of like polyurethane Indian clubs. Um, and I would have to say that like my first introduction with Indian clubs in Balava was not the, like I didn't, because I had just gotten pregnant then I had my son. So my technique wasn't great. Like I just kind of had awareness of it. After I had Leonardo, um, a couple years later, um, I developed infectious colitis from a very serious case of food poisoning. It was the year that cantaloupe was in the news for listeria and spinach for spinach for uh, salmonella or e coli i can't remember which one it was i think it was salmonella so on a monday night i ate a salad by that sunday i crawled to my neighbor's house and i was hospitalized twice and i then had a ton of uh about six months of uh, antibiotics which destroyed my system at that time, my husband's family, their, their family business closed, so my husband became unemployed. And I had to basically rebuild my business from scratch because I was only kind of working part-time. So I found myself working seven days a week while battling colitis, which was debilitating. For a good two years, it was debilitating. I was at size zero, I was gray, you know, like, but I had this thing of just kind of like, all right, I got to I gotta do what I got to do. How I started getting back into these tools and going down the rabbit hole further into learning more about them was um, I, I started creating a training space at home. 
I needed to heal myself. So instead of always being in the gym environment, which I was used to, I wanted to separate work and I wanted to kind of have my own practice. So I started picking up uh, Indian clubs again, uh, mace in particular, before Paul and I really connected uh, and I learned properly from him. And uh, that was a really good nurturing experience. And then I realized as I was continuing to build my strength back, how these circular tools were helping me improve my kettlebell technique. I felt stronger when I deadlifted. I don't do PR on anything, not, not to insult people that do, but I just felt stronger because I was crossing the midline of the body because I was offsetting overhead work with like outward heart shapes or the transverse turn through the shoulders. So I started to see and get completely wrapped up in the history, but also seeing what the history could offer in quality to now the modern person who is using it as a tool for fitness. So back then they use it for survival, they use it to train, you know, for a purpose of battle. And we're not in that lifestyle anymore. So with now teaching and traveling uh, around the world, well, country, teaching workshops, and unfortunately now not England, but that's okay, it'll happen again, you know, is like how you could take what you learn today and, and apply it to what you're doing currently. But the most key important thing that I find is you need to have a whole other thing of accessory training. So like I have naturally an excessive range of motion. But if I ask somebody who does not have that range of motion to swing a mace that requires a certain amount, how do we help them, right? So it's like that's where all like the OS resets come in, the stuff I do with stick mobility, uh, you know, like even using like, you know, a kettlebell bent press and getting under the weight or a kettlebell like windmill and building up that connection to firing the lat to stabilizing that shoulder. Yeah, because like now you know, now that you've been swinging that mace, you know how, you know, so, or how the Indian clubs could help you to understand that transverse turn through the shoulder. So it's, a, it's taking historical fitness, applying it to current fitness. And then there's like a lot of kind of intelligence behind it of like how could you take all these different people, because today what, we're 14, 15 different people. Yeah. And everybody might have something that we have a couple of people of like, yeah, what inhibits their movement. So let's figure out how we could address what's inhibiting their movement so that they could enjoy swinging. And both of you did so well, girl. You were rocking it. Oh, we just started our hey, fantastic. <laughs> right now. See, that's rewarding. That's amazing. And you're here. So we made it all day. That's a win. <laughs> So how long have you been using Indian clubs then? Um, well, like I said, I, I started in 2008, but I didn't didn't really go to, like, I don't think I was taught that well. And not, I'm not insulting who taught me. It was just I wasn't kind of given the full extensive picture of, like, technique, the purpose behind it, you know, proper grip, the breakdown that Paul does. So um, now it's been probably like three years that I've been picking it up again. But like I have a good of, of the of the of the basics. But like when I have an issue with like coordination with the complexity of asynchronous patterns. So I could do the, the basics and do them well and blend them and then have like the, the Indian cross going into inward so I could have the transitional movements. And I could do some asynchronous patterns, but it's a sequencing that gets me caught up. So when we were in our group today, um, and I expressed how like everybody learns differently, I need to be with Paul in person or somebody skilled in person to really absorb it. For for the type of learner I am, maybe and maybe for you too. And I have friends who have like you know very like artistic and, and minds, musical minds that could pick up on the patterning quicker. I struggle with like the coordination if it's these asynchronous things. And I figured, well, you know, what the only thing you could do is take the journey that you're on now and not compare it to somebody else and just enjoy the process and like looking back. So like now I realize like every couple months, like I'll look back at where I was and I'm like, damn, okay, I improved. 
And with mace training, that like I really I really enjoy that too. And I've been doing that for quite a while. And I was competing uh, in mace competitions, but I'm not a very competitive person. <laughs> I, I mean, and, and I love it, and it's like, I'm not, and I just like love it for the joy, so I was one of the first women to do it, I loved it, and now I just want to pretty much like educate, you know, I want to get more into the education pieces, and then how people could like benefit from them, and then if there's something inhibiting their movement, what can we do about it, basically. Well, you're obviously very passionate about uh, educating. I love so, it. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that right away from you. So that's Thanks. Great. But I learned along the way, too. So every time well, I teach, <clears throat> yeah, I, I have a notebook. As you're teaching an amazing amount, just, just from <clears throat> looking and seeing what other people are doing as you're teaching. I think, excuse me, <clears throat> it's the only way to get better, right? Yeah. So, like, you practice and you teach and you apply. So it's like, that's, it's kind of this really nice cycle. And then when we were talking about like what I found helpful about having like that whiteboard and using that to write down the pattern, filming yourself from different angles, you know, in, in true time and then in slow motion. So and I think, you know, most of fitness is to just exercise, right? Or like, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. And, you, you know, you could go to your soul cycle class, you could go to Orange Theory, you could do that. But like when you adopt these tools, it's like it's a it's a practice. It's not it's like it's a commitment and there's it's almost a journey. It is a journey. Oh, it really is. It really is. Yeah. It's an amazing yeah. journey that's like extremely yeah. rewarding. And then if you mix in a little bit of skill based modalities into your other programs, I think you have more appreciation for for movement and what the body is capable of and then you're more likely to not have these dips and waves of like oh I, I exercise for a while then I fall off but if you're like I'm gonna adopt a skill it changes the minds it flips like a switch where now you know you you're like there's a, a deeper purpose behind it Completely. yeah is there a specific type of class you like teaching better than another? You know, I like it all. Like, I think that's part of the, like, I've been asked quite a few times, especially when I go on podcasts, they're like, you know, how do you describe? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know how to describe myself because I, I, I feel like there's a lot of beauty in exploring the gray areas yeah. in movement. So I'm not very, like, dogmatic of, like, this is black, this is white, and that's the only way. I feel like the, there's so much beauty in crossing over different modalities and taking a section from a concept from here and then a section from a concept from there and then, yes, yeah, and like what works for me or appeals to me might not appeal to you, but maybe there's something that we have in common. And I think fitness tries to either put you on this like hamster wheel or like if a system tries to put you into a certain like thought process and belief that excludes you from being open to other things. Yeah, so I'm very like, because I feel like my 20s, I was an athlete as a kid, my 20s were overdoing everything. I think everybody does that in their 20s. Let me go in and day. My 30s was motherhood and then babbling colitis. And then it was also like diving deeper into skill-based modalities and like really kind of like taking on these tools. In my 40s, I think more is about like what I do now is going to set me up for my 50s. So this, what I do in this decade will prepare me for the next decade, decade and so on. And it's much more about like quality of movement, capability, exploring new skills, building on skills, staying strong, and then like connecting with people too along the way and educating. Yeah. Well I know you're also really really into educating women particularly. You've got the pillars of female strength. Female yeah, strength. you know, well I think it's because in the, it's, I f through my my process of education that I've obtained, I've never had a female mentor. Oh, really? No, I've only had male mentors and the only female taught workshops that I've attended were was my yoga certification in my 20s in pre and postnatal. And so I never really saw like, now there's like a lot more women out there doing things, but they were always kind of associated with a company or associated with a brand or they were like, you know, and it was pretty cool is like I, 
kind of collaborate with a multitude of people. Uh -huh. I learn from a multitude of people. I could do what I do with Paul, but then I do my separate things that are my pillars of female strength concept or, so, or something like that. And recently, I've actually had two male trainers reach out to me who have come down and traveled to, to learn the mace. Mm -hmm. And they told me that they prefer having a female point of view. Yeah, and they had different things on that. One of them, Bill was saying how he thinks that a woman has more of like a holistic, circular approach to assessing the, the process yeah. and, and it's not as linear. I'm using somebody else's words, not saying that men are not, just saying the terminology. So there's, I'm not saying, you know. And then Michael came and he's like, I, I, he's like, I wanted to have just the education and the skill be at the forefront and not a compare war. And I was like, well, I didn't ne I never think about how sometimes guys are compare and size one another up. I don't know. Just, Who lifts heavier? That I, or something. I think women size each other up too. So I never think of that. Men experience that too. So it, it's great having both sexes and transgender and whoever, you know, that come and seek out. But it, sometimes it's partly because of the female perspective or the way that, you know, mm -hmm. one thinks. It's just interesting, fascinating by stuff like that. So, so what are some uh, words of wisdom or encouragement for uh, some women out there that might be sitting behind computers and thinking, oh, I, 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 I would go work out if, if only, or... I oh, think I I sometimes in this day and age, right, we're overscheduled or overprogrammed where there's a lot of expectation on us. And I think sometimes we want to project onto others. I think the number one thing is taking responsibility for yourself. And if you don't address what's inhibiting you emotionally, you're never going to get into a, uh, a routine in your fitness that is going to be for the long haul. So that submissing component is oftentimes people never address what is inhibiting them emotionally. So you got to handle that barrier first. And you have to, I think another misconception is like, oh, you need to have an extensive period of time. Since I started creating workshops and traveling more, and then I'm also building on creating online content, my day is insane. So some days I only move for 20, maybe 30 minutes. Wow you know, maybe an hour, but it's all spread out throughout the day. So it, my, my training has become fragmented, but I know it's a, a, for a purpose because my attention is going into other areas that I want to build. Yeah. But even though my training is more fragmented, I feel stronger. I feel smarter about my training, and I believe in intuitive training. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm not a big group class person. I'm not a big, you know, like... Um, pop into a room for that 45 minutes and then leave because I think that disconnects you. So if you go and you start to create something that intrigues you, like you guys came here because you're intrigued by this, it becomes a personal practice. And then you could also go for your run or you could do other things that you enjoy. And I highly recommend people revisiting things that they enjoyed in their childhood, whether it was basketball, whether it was, you know, like, like I took an adult tap class with one of my clients. Yeah. Yeah, that was a blast. But so it's like, I think it's really easy to come up with excuses. And that's not the right word I'm looking for, because I think sometimes excuses get interpreted to that person as negativity. But it's just like, they're, we're adults, right? And we make decisions all the time. It's a responsibility. And it's not always going to be easy. And you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. That's, wow, good answer. Thanks. So, um, can you tell folks that are, might be interested how to find you on Yeah, the, so, the okay, well, I have a, a, like, don't look at my website because I never use it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I spent, like, yeah. a yeah. lot of money and it sits there that I'm like, okay, I'm not very, I don't, I'm not very good with technology and I have no idea how to, so, like, basically on Instagram, I'm kelsbells88. So, kelsbells88 on Instagram. People could always email me. Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at K-M, 
moves, M-O-V-E-S dot com. People could find me on Facebook. I'm going to try to finally figure out how to get my own, like, I'm going to slash my old website and try to start from scratch. <laughs> but mainly, like, on Instagram, that's a great way to reach out to me because um, that's what I primarily use. It's pretty credible on Instagram. I yeah, it's, it's kind of fun. It's, I'm going to follow you back, but it's, like, kind of funny because, like, that was all pretty much started from somebody saying, like, while I was getting strong again from colitis to put it out. And it just, I don't even know. I think if you just kind of enjoy and you share what you're passionate about and you, you stay true to what resonates with you and other people, like people will find, you know, like, oh, like there's a, something that appeals to me. Like I find with like Paul, like why he and I connected was he, he wasn't trying to, he, he presents the, the, the training and the tools. He never makes it about himself. And that's what I find fascinating about Paul. Like, you know, he and he is all about like giving you as much information as he can. And I don't get too tutorial on my my Instagram because I think sometimes it's important to seek out people, right? seek out, learn the process, make the connections. And I'm so ADD in that like, if I started getting too down the rabbit hole of like extra editing and extra tutorials and stuff like that, I know for myself, my energy would go away from my son, from my husband, from my workshops, from the people that I work with in person. So if what I sh do share resonates with somebody, that's fantastic. And if they send a DM and they want more information, I'm more than like happy to help. And I try to sprinkle in a tutorial like here and there and stuff like that. But mainly it's like what I do right before I pick up my son. Yeah. I have that like little window yeah. Yeah. and then I like There's type it up and then I get right. to the school at 325 is school pickup and I pull it at 327 yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, Woo! But that's how it works. I feel like, you know, I, I, of course I want to help the, the greater population and, and, and give information, but I just like, I, I get too analytical. I get too caught in my head that I would want to like erase something and reword something. So I'm just yeah. like, here's a sprinkle I and they could come find me here and there. And yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. That's great. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Thank that you for having me, great. guys. It's been a I great really class, appreciate it. So oh, so glad. Pow! <laughs>